This video will discuss why chemically equivalent protons in NMR do not split one another. So let's start by considering this type of molecule. So I guess this would be 1122 tetrachloroethane, I suppose. So we have two protons in this, in this molecule. They're on adjacent carbons to one another. But you'll notice that due to the symmetry of the molecule, these two protons are chemically equivalent. You can't say which is which because the molecule, due to its symmetry, um, these two protons are in exactly the same chemical environment. So when we have this type of situation, these protons do not split one another as they would if they were in a different chemical environment with different shielding constants. So this video is to help explain a little bit why that is and why we don't get splitting in chemically equivalent uh, protons. Okay, so as we did in our video on spin-spin coupling, we can define a Hamiltonian, our magnetic Hamiltonian for this system, which is going to be the negative magnetogyric ratio of the hydrogen nucleus times the magnetic field generated by our NMR spectrometer, B0, times 1 minus the shielding constant of nucleus 1, which we might call this one, perhaps, times the z component of the nuclear spin angular momentum operator acting on nucleus 1 minus the same gamma b naught times 1 minus shielding constant of nucleus 2 times the same z component of the nuclear spin angular momentum operator acting on nucleus 2 and then plus the coupling term Planck's constant times j12 over h bar squared times the dot product of the spin angular momentum operator acting on nucleus 1 and the same operator acting on nucleus 2. All right, so in this case, what we have is we mentioned that our protons are chemically equivalent. And when they are chemically equivalent, that means that our shielding constants are going to be equal. So sigma 1 is equal to sigma 2, which I'm going to now define as sigma A. So that means that we can split our Hamiltonian into a reference Hamiltonian and a perturbation, so H0 and H1. So H0 is going to equal minus the magnetogyric ratio times the mag initial magnetic field generated by our spectrometer times 1 minus sigma A times IZ1 plus IZ2. These now have the same uh, prefactor in front of them, so we can group them together. All right, and our coupling is now the, the perturbation once more. All right, so we can define some different states here. So we have psi 1, where they are both spin up, psi 4, where they're both spin down. So psi 1 and psi 4 would be the lowest energy and highest energy states on this graph where we have our energy plotted in units of h bar gamma b naught times 1 minus sigma a, much as we would in uh, the other video on spin-spin coupling. But notice now that there's the extra catch that because these two are equivalent, um, they have to be indistinguishable from one another. And that means we have to do this kind of linear combination because we don't know which one is spin up and spin down. We just know that one is spin up and one is spin down. And because of the way that the, uh, the the because of the way that spin works in this particular system, um, the state where we have the where we have the difference between those two states is actually forbidden. I'm not going to go into further details why, but it's just due to the restrictions of how spin works. So what the only other state that's allowed is this psi three, where we have one over square root of two for normalization, times alpha one beta two. So spin up uh, nucleus 1 times spin down a nucleus 2 plus spin down a nucleus 1 times spin up a nucleus 2. So here it's, it's combining those two states, making it indistinguishable so we don't know which one is spin up and spin down. We just know that one is and one is the other. All right, so once we apply all of our operators and we, get our, we do the same first order perturbation theory we did in the video on spin-spin coupling, the result that you get is that the first order energy, so the addition in the energy that happens due to the perturbation, is actually going to have the same effect on every single allowed energy level. 
So this, this non-allowed state of, of the uh, difference here actually goes down by minus 3 fourths uh, JAA. But our, our other state here, other states here are actually going up all by the same value, by 1 fourth. Uh, I believe that should be H times JAA. So let me address that. There we go. Okay, so we have each of them gets a first order energy, which is adding one fourth HJA. So our original transitions were just a single transition, which was equal in energy from one to three and from three to four, as, as, as denoted over here. And now we have the same transitions that are allowed, but every energy level has displaced upward by the same amount. So the only frequencies that we observe are all the same, and they're all still equal to the values that we observed initially. So even though our even though spin-spin coupling does affect chemically equivalent protons, um, they do change their energy levels. Um, due to the extra restriction of them being equivalent and thus having this extra restriction about what states they can be in, that gives us um, this requirement which makes our uh, which makes our frequencies that we observe the same as if they were not coupling at all.